Welcome to our Beyond 20 campaign, a celebration of One Joshua Group's 20 years of service excellence. This is a One Joshua Group production, providing access to information and experts to help improve quality of life and health outcomes. Thank you for joining us for our 20th anniversary and beyond. Community engagement increases the visibility and the understanding of issues and empowers communities to have their say over decisions that affect their lives, their towns, their cities, and their neighborhoods. And we are fortunate today to be joined by Pamela Cooper. Uh, Ms. Cooper is a recruitment core and clinical research Mobile Unit Manager at Morehouse School of Medicine. Thank you for joining us, Ms. Cooper. Thank you, Mr. Payne. It's a pleasure to be here today. I'm excited about our dialogue and I'm sure a wonderful conversation. Thank you. And thank you also. And we are being joined by Steve Wakefield. Mr. Wakefield is the director of the HIV Trials uh, External Relations Network, retired. Wakefield, thank you very much for joining us. It's a pleasure. Uh, and I'm glad you were able to schedule it before my nap now that I'm a retired person. Well, we hope you'll just continue to dream about those great things as you shared your dreams and your visions with us through your work. Um, in the opening, you heard me mention community engagement. We hear that a lot population, health, community engagement, having a seat at the table, building the table. Ms. Cooper, Mr. Wakefield, exactly how do we define community engagement? We'll start with you, Ms. Cooper. You know, that's interesting, uh, Mr. Payne, because community engagement often depend on what targeted mission that anybody is trying to seek out in the community. Uh, as you mentioned a lot of different titles back in the older days it was just being a part of the community and then we changed it to this wonderful and amazing word called community engagement for me community engagement is just taking part of what you're already in which is your own community and making a difference by coming together and and see what worked best for everybody uh, making sure that you don't go in as the subject matter expert, depending on what field you're in, but go in and be a part of the community in which you already live in and to just basically hear the voice of the people. Uh, I have what I call the LLL, the triple L, lesson, learn, and leverage. And for me, that's pretty much what community engagement means for me. I go in, I listen. And then I learn what the need is, and then I assist the community in leveraging. So for me, that's community engagement, just trying to make a difference in the best way that I possibly can. So the return investment is just not about what I'm out to do, but what others are needing. Uh, Mr. Wakefield, and you say about community engagement? It's an, always an interesting question. Thank you, Ms. Cooper, for that. You know, because when I started community engagement, work. We just called it outreach. Hmm. We, had, we didn't have a long term for it. Then it became outreach with a purpose. And then people started asking us to do outreach on their behalf. Hmm. And one of the challenges with that is I have a set of values and I'm not going to outreach for somebody on your behalf if I don't know what you want people to do. Mm -hmm. So it's always outreach with a purpose. But for me, it became over time and it still is. How do I do outreach that ensures health equity for the people that you're asking me to do outreach with? And how do I boost your cultural responsiveness to their needs? Because I'm not going to just do outreach to a total stranger and ask them to engage with your research or with your health care or with anything else that you want them to do. I'm going to do I believe in doing outreach that is on behalf of the people who we're trying to engage. And that's very important to me. So we hear that uh, effective community engagement, effective outreach has to have a shared vision. And Wakefield, you mentioned a very important word, values. 
we have to be mutually respectful each of the other. Certainly we have to be clear in what we're communicating and transparent about that. And in the end, we have to engage that word so that there is shared decision-making. And for you, Ms. Cooper, and, and, and you, Mr. Wakefield, each of us has to be committed on our part to be sure that whatever the, the, the mission is, the activity is, that each of us is committed to that. What do we do, um, Pam and, and Wakefield, so that we leverage the playing field to better engage all of the partners uh, in this relationship. Um, Wakefield, let's go to you first this time. Well, it's very interesting that you use the word partners because most of us have partners in life. And when we think of romantic partners, we have a list of qualifications and we have something we want them to provide in a relationship with us. We, for me, when we think of healthcare or research outreach, we want people to partner with us if they have certain health statuses that would make them good partners for the question we're asking. But if the word partner means I care about you, who you are, what you do, what, what I can get in this partnership, and I care about you after I've achieved what I want from the partnership. And so how do I get engaged with the whole person and make sure there's a benefit to them, not just a benefit to me in getting my research answer? And, and you, Pam? You know, <laughs> uh, Mr. Wayfield kind of put, you know, hit it dead on the nail. You know, uh, for me, is transparency. You have to be transparent. And when you talk about partners, there's that old saying about all money ain't good money. Well, all partnerships are not good partnerships. It just depends on what it is that you feel that other individual and yourself, what's the common denominator that you both are looking for. Uh, if I'm looking for someone who I really need to partner with because, as he said, I'm in a singer neighborhood where I need to find resources for them to have food and there's a food desert. Well, I'm not going to go to a car dealership looking for that type of partner. I'm going to yeah. go find someone that can give me those resources while well, I'm able to meet the need of that uh, individual or that community. So for me, it's just being transparent. Don't make promises that you know you're not going to keep just to benefit yourself on what you're trying to do. I hate when people, even in research, and, and Mr. Wakefield, you know this, I hate people who chase numbers. You know, if you're going to recruit anybody for any particular uh, project or program that you have, make sure that you got compassion. Make sure that you're looking at uh, exactly what that other partner or collaborating partnership look like. You know, what is it that that partner already have that's existent? You know, you don't want to partner with somebody who's starting from the ground up because, <laughs> you know, you end up helping them build. But you need a partner that you want to be able to say, OK, they already have a portfolio and it doesn't have to be a big portfolio. It could be something very small, but you want to make sure that you're very transparent about what your needs are. That's just how I look at it. I don't make promises. I go in and try to help people build on what they're wanting out in the community. Um, it takes trust. Trust is another whole factor. You know, in this day and time and what the climate is like, you got to make sure you find a trust factor. And sometimes that requires calling Mr. Wakefield and say, hey, Mr. Wakefield, do you know ABCD? Have you ever worked with ABCD before? Because I have a trust factor with Mr. Wakefield. So I'm going to take Mr. Wakefield at his word. Wakefield, you have a response? Mm -hmm. For me, I, I just want to build on that. I think it's important to uh, ask myself, what do I have myself believing? What are my assumptions about the person? Just because they're the right height or the right blood type, or they live on the right block in the neighborhood, what else do I have myself believing about it? And I think that's the biggest challenge with people who want to do community engagement is, is doing self-engagement. What do I have myself believing? 
And then how am I going to ask the person to respond to my set of beliefs? And is that okay with them? So Pam, in, in the work that you do at Morehouse School of Medicine, um, you are involved in research and including a mobile unit. What are the benefits of meeting people where they are as it relates to community or engaging the community? Meeting people where they are who we engage the community. The mobile unit here at Morehouse School of Medicine, uh, I came up with that concept uh, back in 2008, actually, and we didn't get it funded till about 2012. And one of the reasons why I felt it was important for us to have a mobile unit, which we don't only use it for our research, we end up looking at it as a mobile health equity unit where we go out and do point of care services as well, like blood pressures and glucose and cholesterol, because access to health care is challenging in a lot of neighborhoods, especially in the rural areas. So when we came up with the idea of having a mobile unit, one of the things I felt was important that we would be able to reach the people where they are. Um, you know, usually you go out, you recruit, you make an appointment for people to come to your center. But I felt like if we were to take the unit out in the community and if people said they're interested and we go ahead and provide them that opportunity right then instead of having to find transportation or wait for us to call them for appointment, then you meet the need of the people in the community. So that's engagement within itself because you're providing a resource or an avenue for them not to have to go out of their way, but make it where we're there for them to serve them. So uh, once we got the mobile unit up and running, and right now Ms. Dr. Rara McCaspin in the Clinical Research Center is managing that mobile unit uh, because I transitioned over to a, another part of research, which is looking at uh, ancestry and prostate cancer screenings. But having the mobile unit me really made a difference for us as it addressed our mission statement with leading the creation and advancement of health equity because we became street people, right? We took health care to the street, research to the street, and it, it really benefited us because when people saw that unit coming, they automatically knew sometimes that we were either doing a research project mm -hmm. or our Hill Clinic at Morris School of Medicine which is like our first and second year uh, medical uh, school students, that they were able to go out in community with an attending physician to be able to do uh, primary care visits for those who are underinsured or either they don't have insured at all. So that's just been amazing for us to be able to take it to the street, do the work in the street, do the engagement at a whole different level for us. So it just turned out to really be successful for us here at Moore School of Medicine. So we really just set the model for a lot of people to really want to take interest in making sure now that even if they don't have a mobile unit, if, you, if they're in the right building or in the right area, they can just set up shop wherever they are. Mm. I wish I can go to Seattle where Mr. Wakefield is. <laughs> Now, Wakefield, you are um, working the HIV trials network generally. We talked about meeting people where they are. Specifically, as it relates to HIV, how important is it as we engage communities to meet people where they are as we address the issue of HIV and AIDS? Well, I think it's probably paramount. You know, it's essential. You have to... Uh, as I said, check yourself. You, the people, HIV has been stigmatized since the very beginning. And people make a lot of assumptions. You know, with, with, when people are obese, the assumption is, why don't they just eat less? With HIV, people make assumptions about someone's gender or sexual orientation or identity. And yes, they may circumstantially have a choice of a sexual partner. But, you know, we've got to, you got to be able to talk about sex if you want to talk to them about HIV. Taking that van on the street removes a barrier to access to the care that you're going to offer. And it, it invites people in because you trust me if you know who I am and you're able to talk to me about who I am. Don't think you can have an opportunity to do research with me about sex and then wait till the end of the conversation and say, and by the way, in addition to a blood sample, we want to check some of your organs and check who you are. Let's have an upfront conversation about what we're trying to do. 
And just to pick it back on what Mr. Wakefield said, if you don't mind, Mr. Payne, when we go out in the community to make community know that we're just like you, we we mm -hmm. we look like you, we're just like you. We don't go out with the long lab coats on and the scrubs on. You know, we might have a, a polo shirt on that says, you know, Morris School of Medicine or whatever we're doing out in the community, but we're dressed down where people can feel more comfortable and, and we have a real conversation. We find out a lot about what's going on. Uh, in their families and their households. And if we have resources that we connect them to, we're able to do that. So sometimes you may be going in the community just to do one something, but a lot of times you end up addressing socioeconomic challenges out in the community, but being able to have uh, those partnerships, like we talked about Mr. Payne and Mr. Wakefield about partnerships, we're able to connect them to those partnerships and those resources. And I think the important part, meeting people where they are, cannot be a single shot. You have to have multiple opportunities for people to invest in themselves when you when you go into the community, because the need is so great. I mean, nobody just needs one thing. We need education, information, and for you, Pam, and for you, Wakefield, where as a mobile unit may be providing information in one side, the other is to be sure that we can provide some form of treatment or at least access of resources for treatment. And that's a very, very critical part. It allows people to be able to share in their decision making. Now, um, Pam, you mentioned early on that you were uh, involved in the mortuary delivery side as well. And I'm curious about that um, and meeting people's need. What do we learn at the end of life? that would help us in, in meeting the need using community outreach and community engagement. Is it any different in, in those families and, and before they get to that point? You know, for me, it has really been rewarding because I get to see it now from the bench scientists to the clinical trial, to the inpatient, outpatient, to end of life, right? And what I find on the mortuary side is that when you meet the family and you have a, they get comfortable with you and realizing that this is just not a business for us, but we want to make sure that you understand that we feel your grief. And when they get comfortable with us, they start sharing with us that family health history. You know, mm -hmm. my aunt died of this about a month ago, or my grandmother died with this about three years ago. And, and they start opening up to you about their challenges as it relates to their health or their challenges that's related to what's going on in the family. For me, that engagement is just listening, you know, mm -hmm. and, and being able to share with them other opportunities that might be out there, depending on what their challenges are. So the engagement never ends. It just get larger and larger, just depending on where you are and who you're talking to at that moment. So when you say community engagement, and that's what like uh, Mr. Wayfield said earlier, we called it outreach, right? But now it's such a large meaning because anything you do, and you have a client in any capacity, Mr. Wakefield is my client. Mr. Payne's my client. Anytime you have somebody that you're working with, you really are each other's clients. So you have to just, in the mortuary area, it's just a matter of listening and not only just comforting them, but just letting them know that, you know, there is a family history. If I'm talking from a healthcare standpoint, there is a family history that's taking place. And if they talk about, well, my mother had cancer, my grandmother had cancer, then I might say, you ever thought about checking to see if your primary care physician can write this for you to have a genetic testing done just to see where that family history is. So part of all this really just comes back to another E word, which is education. You know, providing that information to the community members in which you come in contact with, just providing them information, just educating them a little bit on things that they may share with you that they're not knowledgeable of. And that's what I do in that full circle, is try to educate people. Wakefield, uh, in the HIV AIDS sector, we look at um, underrepresented, uh, marginalized, I don't particularly care for either one of those words, but 
are the specific challenges in minority communities still about talking about an issue that's stigmatized? Can we do a better job to reaching the community um, to these areas that may be stigmatized or taboo that we don't talk about as often, prostate cancer being one, as often as we do in some other cases where people are impacted? I think often the challenge is our silence. We feel we have we have been in communities that have had disparities in healthcare for so long that we are we're comfortable not saying anything or saying, well, we're not doing any better in heart disease, or we're not doing any better in diabetes. Well, that doesn't mean that we're doing okay. That means we should be having additional action. And when it comes to HIV, it's not just the education, it's, it's telling people there's something that can enrich your life. You know, science is not where it was 40 years ago. And we could actually give you a pill that would mean you wouldn't have to worry about getting HIV or you wouldn't have to worry about transmitting HIV. And the biggest challenge sometimes for us culturally is that means we're gonna to have to talk about sex. Some of us have gone to institutions where you never talk about sex or you always pretend like all sex is, is only for procreation. And then we have the public conversations around sexual health that don't allow us to talk about, we might talk about a food desert, but we shouldn't talk about a, a maternity desert. We shouldn't talk about the needs in terms of somebody with HIV of, of making sure they're protected and you know my my ideal program in terms of outreach is a Mother's Day program where the grandmothers are doing the HIV education. I'm still going to try to make that happen someday because Mother's Day board could talk about sex and nobody would kick them out of the church. <laughs> so that's interesting. We get back to both uh, what what Pam shared with us and Wakefield what you shared with us in those principles of quality community engagement. We have to be sure that we have a shared vision and that we have those values that each of us respect. And we need to be respectful, mutually respectful in giving the information and listening to other people. Communication is always key. And being transparent about that makes it even more critical to reach a stage of uh, commitment. For each of you, do you think that there are some key strategies for lowering um, the the barriers for communities to engage them so that they do come into your mobile unit and to you Wakefield, they do participate in the clinical trials. Can we do something better than what we've been doing? For me, the strategy is to recognize what has been wrong for a long time, acknowledge it and say, my commitment with you is to do better. So. I don't want somebody coming into my community doing research and then leaving and I don't know what they learn and I don't benefit from what they learn. Mm -hmm. So if they come into my community, I want to promise they're going to stay in the community and they're going to help me have access to that drug or that intervention that's that really we know now works. But also pay attention to the fact that if I'm going to take that drug, I need water every day or I need food every day because I need food to take the drug with and be a partner with me in doing what needs to be done versus only partnering while you're trying to get your question answered. Mm. Mm. For me to piggyback on what Mr. Wakefield is saying, for me, consistency. A lot of times, uh, one of the barriers I've noticed um, in the past was going to, you go in the community, you taking your project or your program and you find yourself, once you get the numbers or the information, then you're out. And I remember the late, great James Orange, Reverend James Orange told me one day, you know, oh, it's about time for y'all to come out from behind them black gates over there, you know, and, and be more in this community, you know? So <laughs> I, I got tickled about it, but he was telling the truth. So I think just don't go out in the community and just get 
your your uh, information or do your program, you have to continue that relationship. And that's something I think we need to do better is mm-hmm. consist, consistency and continuously so that we can be able to say we are partners with you. And you have to have commitment to do community engagement. You just can't do it if it's just because you're getting a paycheck. It's not a nine to five. It's not a Monday through Friday. You have to have commitment. You have to have compassion for people and your skill set. People skills have definitely have to be on point because everybody's not the same. You know, everybody's different and it depends on what's going on in their lives at that point in time, how they're going to relate uh, to you and with you. So for me, it's just a matter of developing those relationships, keeping those relationships. One of the things that taught me in the beginning when I came here to Morale School of Medicine was, oh my God, what am I going to do? You know, I thought I was on out here handling business because I've been working in the community. But I got knocked down a few times by just listening to the community. So what I started doing was when I worked with the church and they're having a health fair, I go get on their committee. I go to that church that mm-hmm. afternoon. I be on their committee. That help them know I'm not just out here just to get what I need, but I want to be part of you. So I join their community. Their task force. A lot of times I end up being a consultant. So when the next year come, they'll call me and say, "Hey Pam, are you available?" Because for me, I don't let them call me Miss Cooper because if I go in with that type type of title and having them call me Miss Cooper. To me, it makes me feel like I'm here and they're here. I'm Pam. I'm just Pam. Wherever I go, I'm just Pam. So mm-hmm. and I and I get the professional respectfulness that they're trying to give me. But for me, when dealing with the community, I'm just Pam. So I go in and I join committees. And I think if a lot of people would be and understand the type of work like Mr. Wakefield and I, and of course, one Joshua group, how we come together and how we work with people internal and external, then they have a better understanding of what it really means to what partnerships and collaborations really mean. It doesn't mean that I'm just going to partner with Mr. Wakefield on his HIV project where the grandmothers are going to go out and educate the community. I'm not just going to partner with him one time if it works and he said Pam we doing this next year I'm gonna say hey I'm in with you I'm just not gonna bail out on him just because okay I don't help Wakefield his first time he got it on his own you have to be committed with whatever you decide to do and you have to be transparent from the beginning not in the middle of it Mm -hmm. Uh, Pam mentioned uh, Reverend James Orange Reverend Orange uh, in the Atlanta area was a civil rights advocate but most of all, Reverend Orange advocated for health as a civil right. Um, so we, we recognize what he did there. Um, Wakefield, back to you, and you and Pam both told us that we need to be sure that we're asking the right questions when we are engaging the community, not giving the answers, but being sure that we ask the right questions, that we create those spaces so that we get input from them. Wakefield, thank you so very much for telling us about the success story of grandmothers talking about HIV AIDS. We have to look for those success stories so that people buy into those and create safe spaces for people. Pam, you talked about the difference of being Miss Cooper and being Pam and Wakefield and the same with you and what you do. We need to look like them. We need to find out what their experiences are. Wakefield, going back again, uh, I know that although you have primarily worked both domestically and internationally in the HIV AIDS community and in within your trials network, I want to go just for a moment. Um, World AIDS Day is coming up. Um, and to find out, are there any differences when we look domestically and internationally in engaging communities. You mentioned culture. Pam talked about culture as well. That's where people are. Any words of wisdom you want to share with us and we consider where we are and that not all places are the same? I think for me for World AIDS Day is we just have witnessed one of the major miracles of science in my lifetime. That was in less than two years someone was able to create a vaccine for COVID and that most of us 
have had some of that COVID science in our bodies. The same is not true for HIV. So people have to understand that it's the same scientists that did that COVID work from my perspective, um, who are still working on an HIV vaccine. But meanwhile, back at the ranch, if you know you have HIV risk, you need to take an HIV pill. Before that, you need to take an HIV test so they know which pill to give you, the one that's gonna protect you from becoming infected or the one that's gonna keep you healthy so that you live a long and healthy life. Those are my World AIDS Day messages. So those are those member experiences we go out into those communities to find out exactly where those people are. Um, Pam, I, uh, you mentioned earlier and to, to thank you because there have been times when we've sat on different sides of the microphone. So I, I thank you for that. Uh, and, and including one Joshua group in um, some of your morning programming. Um, and now as we're celebrating our 20th anniversary, it is considerable that um, you, Mr. Wakefield, and you, Ms. Cooper, are helping to celebrate our anniversary. And we thank you as we celebrate you for what you do and look and encourage people to have an amazing community engagement event, that it is extraordinary, that it is the same kind of relationship in the community that they ask, when are you going to do this again? Because that's truly engagement when you return to do something the next time. I had to laugh, at, uh, Pam. I'm so glad that we get from under those tents and we get to a mobile unit so we're not running from the rain and the wind. Uh, so it's nice to be able to go inside of a mobile unit and also to be able to use a, 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 a vehicle, a mobile unit to go to places that Wakefield has talked about. It's a little different than giving people the kind of privacy to have discussions so they can tell you about their lessons learned so we can be better at engaging the communities. I want to get you for the last time, what would your takeaway be for this time we spent together so we can better engage the community? And what should we look for going forward to create those kind of better engagement strategies? I'll go first, if Mr. Wayfield. I think uh, I think when you talk about um, making it better, look at what hadn't worked for you or for your pro your project or program. What hasn't worked, and go to the community and ask them why they think it didn't work. I think if we would stop sitting around the table and trying to create this big strategic planning without community at the table. Because a lot of times we do that. We we say what it should look like or, or how we're going to execute it. But I think uh, just having this amazing conversation was had my brain going as well. But it just allowed me and hopefully others to see that you can't do community true community engagement without community at the table. You can come up with whatever model or whatever uh, concept you may want for you to for your project or program to be successful. But the voice of the community, which I'm going to say, that's your voice of reasoning. Uh, the voice of the community is very important. And that's why you have the community advisory boards. This is why you should do focus groups. This is why you should have task forces. So I think if people would engage that a little bit more, instead of just looking at, I got this whole design, this methodology that I want to do, and, and they put it out there and you sit at a table and have a round table discussion, even though we're in the community, we live in the community, but we don't always have the mindset of some of the community members. So I think just engaging the community on the front part, on the front end, instead of in the middle and the end, I think will make a difference and just be transparent. And, and I would wrap that up with saying right in the middle of word, the word community is unity. And if you want something from the community, you need to believe in unity enough to go in and be a part of instead of being apart from. And instead of wearing your, your, your nice lab coat or your, we are, we, we're glad you earned your degree 
to put on a t-shirt and come and sit without a notepad where you have your list of questions, but sit with me and hear who I am and hear what I might bring to the table in unity. And the people who have been successful in doing community outreach and doing community engagement have cared about that unity. Well, this is extremely important. Uh, the work that you do is important. We thank you so very much for the work you do. And we congratulate you on this journey that you've helped all of us um, be better advocates for health, uh, to be able to achieve the levels of equity that we deserve. And to also remember that, as we've heard many times, if there's not a seat at the table, bring a standing chair, bring a folding chair. I would advocate stand up. You don't have to sit down. So sometimes we may need to stand up to be heard uh, and just wherever it is, participate without, with a chair, without a chair, with a table, without a table, just participate so that we can be heard and that we can engage, not just to be engaged. Pam Cooper, thank you so very much for all that you do. Mr. Wakefield, thank you so very much for all that you do. And thank each of you for joining us as we celebrate our 20th anniversary and beyond. And as Wakefield and Pam would say, be kind and be considerate. And as one Joshua group would say, always. Thank you for joining us. And please join us for our future podcast series as we celebrate our 20th anniversary and beyond. This edition of Beyond 20 is a Life Beat podcast sponsored by One Joshua Group, your strategic source of engagement to improve life through better health, education, and information. For more information, visit us at theonejoshuagroup.com or follow our work on LinkedIn, Facebook, Instagram, and Twitter using hashtag OneJGCollabs. One Joshua Group, building capacity, expanding resources, joining what you know with what we've learned.